A very warm welcome to the second of this academic year's Koinonia Seminars, a joint project between Westminster Abbey and the Diocese of London. Our first seminar uh, this year was presented by Professor Jim Walters on religious imaginings of the future, and you can catch on that up on that seminar via our YouTube channel. Today, we are particularly delighted to welcome uh, Sister, Lee, Sister Natalie Beckhart um, to speak to us on the theme, Becoming a Synodal Church, a Call to Foster Ecumenism. The intention behind these seminars is to present to a wider audience contemporary theological thinking and reflection. And Sister Natalie comes to us with an extraordinary array of experience on the topic in hand. She is a Xavierist sister, educated in Paris and at Boston College. Sister Natalie is currently Undersecretary of the Synod of Bishops of the Catholic Church, making her the first woman to hold this position. A renowned lecturer and speaker, she is the author of numerous publications on synodality and synods, young people and youth ministry, vocations and religious life, the church and mission. The Roman Synod, for a Synodal Church, Communion, Participation and Mission is the most remarkable international event and in many ways I think the most remarkable attempt at gathering together the sense of the faithful in any church at any point in history. So we're particularly delighted that Natalie has agreed to speak to us this afternoon. She will speak for around 40 minutes uh, after which you are very warmly invited to pose your questions. So please be writing them down as the seminar progresses. And you can type your questions into the chat box, which I will then pose on your behalf once Sister Natalie has finished speaking. But for now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Sister Natalie Beckart to speak to us on the theme, Becoming a Synodal Church, a call to foster ecumenism. Thank you so much, uh, doc, Reverend Dr. Jamie. It's a great honor to be with you and all those who are connected. I'm really happy and delighted to share with you about our experience of uh, this uh, particular synod uh, on synodality. And uh, so I would like to share with you First, my best greetings from Rome. And now with a PowerPoint, I will try to uh, present uh, about this uh, team, Becoming a Synodal Church, a call to foster Eucommunism. The Catholic Church uh, has uh, started a synod on October 2021, a synod convoked by Pope Francis uh, on this topic for a synodal church communion participation mission. So in a way, what the church is called to do now is to become more and more a church as people of God, as you can see on this logo, churning together where is your situation, your vocation, your role, your age, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And the purpose of this synod is very clear. Is it is about the synodal conversion of the church. It's to retrieve the style of the early church to be first a church as people of God, as communion, as community, in which all the baptized are called to be protagonists. As baptized, they are called uh, to be missionary disciples. And this journey of the Catholic Church is really to serve better the world of today, we should always speak about synodality in our mind as missionary synodality. And uh, to introduce uh, this um, sharing with you, I would like to present this synodal process that is a little bit new uh, compared to other synod of bishops. I will come back on that. The synod of bishop has been instituted uh, at the end of the Second Vatican Council at the beginning more as an event to gather uh, delegates from bishops from all the countries. And this time we have designed this synodal process with different stages. 
the synod has started in October 2021. It was open in Rome by Pope Francis. Uh, but then one week after, it was opened by each bishop in all the dioceses around the world. So uh, the, the process is to listen to all the faithful. And for the Catholic Church, it's really the first time in all the church, the history of the church, that a synod is convoked for the old church and to involve a very broad uh, range of uh, people. We have started the local consultation at the, uh, in the grassroots at the level of the diocese. So there were a first phase in the diocese. Then each diocese has done a kind of synthesis of all the listening and consultation. Then uh, it was gathered at the level of bishops' conference. It's usually uh, one country. And then in our secretariat, we have received all this synthesis from all over the world, answering uh, the consultation we have opened. And with that, we have drafted a document called Document for the Continental Stage, because it was then the idea that we give back the result of the consultation to the local churches, and uh, we had a continental uh, phase with some continental meetings in all continents. And uh, we have separated uh, Middle East and uh, North America and uh, South America. So we had seven continental meetings last uh, February and March. And with the final documents, with the results of this uh, continental meeting in which the delegates uh, reflect on our document and the situation. And it was for the first time an ecclesial assembly, not only with bishops, but with a wide range of, uh, of people. Uh, from that, we have drafted a document called Working Document for the October Assembly. We have just experienced in Rome that was a general uh, ordinary assembly, the first session of this general ordinary assembly of the Synod of Bishops, in which we had around 400 delegates from all over the world, most of them elected by the Bishops' Conference. And so now we are in this stage three because October was a first session and to deepen our discernment, because discernment takes time, we will have a second session with the same uh, members of uh, this assembly of the Synod of Bishops next October. So we are now, uh, I am now speaking with you uh, at a stage in which we are in this intercession. And the idea is that at the end of October 2024, we have some proposals. The Synod uh, in the Catholic Church is a consultative body uh, to help the Pope. And at the end of the Synod, uh, the Pope can write um, post-synodal exhortation and take decisions according also to all this long process of discernment. And we have to think about the process, not only as a bottom-up process, but as you can see on this slide, really with this idea of circularity and a dialogue uh, between the local churches and the universal church. Because in our vision, the ecclesiology of synodality is really uh, to look at the church, not only as a church as people of God, but a church of local churches. And uh, it's, as you see, a long process. The, the October Assembly was one step in a long process involving all the church. And during this month of October, we had also different uh, steps and we started the synod. And I think that was a very, very strong sign. We started at the end, at the end of uh, our works. We had an important ecumenical vigil prayer called Together that was prepared not only with the community of Tese, but also with the Dicastery for Unity of Christian, our secretariat. And uh, it was not only for all the synod members who were there, and uh, it was presided by Pope Francis with all, uh, almost all many other head of churches. And we were very blessed to have uh, 
your Archbishop West, uh, Justin Welby, who, were, uh, who was also with us. But uh, on St. Peter's Square, this uh, ecumenical prayer vigil that has been prepared with delegates from all Christian communion was really a kind of historical moment expressing uh, the possibility of unity uh, in a prophetic way, uh, the idea that we can all pray together and manifest our call for unity. It was a very strong sign for our world and also, I think, for ecumenism. And with especially this prayer vigil uh, that we have experienced together um, on last September 30, I think more and more we realize that we are really in a kind of chaos for ecumenism. And as the Catholic Church is moving on to deepen uh, our call for uh, synodality, we experience at the same time, and that's really what I want to share with you, that we can't become more synodal without uh, deepening and fostering our ecumenical relationship. It goes end in end. And I read the introduction of the final uh, document uh, of our, uh, that we draft at the end of this month of October. In this, uh, we call that, and I invite you to read it, a Synodal Church in Mission. It's a synthesis report of what we have done during this month of October. And I quote, this session of the Synodal Assembly opened with a profound ecumenical gesture. The Together Prayer Vigil saw the presence of numerous other leaders and representatives of different Christian communions alongside Pope Francis, a clear and credible sign of the will to work together in the spirit of unity of faith and exchange of gifts. This highly significant event also allowed us to recognize that we are in a ecumenical chaos and to reaffirm that what unites us is greater than what divides us. And I think it's really this call that uh, we discern more and more. And uh, this synod, in many ways, is really uh, fostering this call to deepen uh, you and to foster your communism. And I want to come back to, uh, to the Second Vatican Council, because what we are living now, uh, what we are experiencing with this synod of bishops is really a fruit of the Second Vatican Council. I like to quote a um, theologian from Australia, Armand Rush, who says, synodality is the Second Vatican Council in a nutshell. So we realized 60 years after the Second Vatican Council, that was uh, really a major step, especially for uh, the unity of Christian. We realized that we haven't finished to receive and to implement the ecclesiology uh, highlighted by the Second Vatican Council. And in a way, we can say that this process we are experiencing as Catholic Church, but will, with all other churches, because from, uh, especially after the Second Vatican Council, we understand that uh, everything a church is experiencing is not just for ourselves, but uh, we are called to live together and to share our journey. So uh, it's a commitment to continue to work together. And as the Second Vatican Council has highlighted that the restoration of unity among all Christians is one of the principal concerns of the Second Vatican Council, we can see that as a fruit of the Second Vatican Council, this, this synod we are experiencing now, that is really a synod to help us to uh, renew ourselves. So it's a path of conversion and it's a step for the renewal of the church. And it, uh, it has, uh, in the light of the Council, it has really... Um, the ecumenical dimension. And through this synod, we understand more and more that really 
the way to understand the mission of the church is as our constitution uh, on the church Lumen Gentium, one of the major documents of the Second Vatican Council states, the church is called to be a sign and instrument of union with God and of the unity of all humanity. And this synod uh, on synodality, in a way, is really a synod to help us to understand and to discern more and more what is the deep vocation of the church in the world of today and how we have to be the church in the world of today, the same church from the beginning, but in our context, in our uh, historical uh, context uh, today. And it's this synod is ready to help us to put into practice the vision of the Council, the ecclesiological vision of the Second Vatican Council. And the institution of the Synod of Bishops is that I am serving now as under secretary was in, created just at the end of the Synod and the Catholic Church regularly organized those assembly of bishops. But from the beginnings, as a fruit of the Second Vatican Council, there are always fraternal delegates from other churches. And during this Synod, for the first time, we had a bigger number, so 12 fraternal delegates attended the October Assembly, and we were blessed to have one bishop from your Anglican Church, uh, Bishop Martin Warner. And the constitution uh, of uh, our Synod of Bishops, uh, we had a new constitution promulgated by Francis in September 2018, really highlight that uh, this the Synod of Bishop, as a fruit of the Second Vatican Council, has really an important uh, ecumenical nature. And I quote Pope Francis, moreover, I am confident that by encouraging a conversion of the papacy, which can help make the exercise of my ministry more faithful to the meaning which Jesus Christ wished to give it and to the present needs of evangelization, the activity of the Synod of Bishops will be able to make its own contribution to the reestablishment of unity among all Christians according to the will of God. And uh, Pope Francis also opened the possibility uh, to organize for reasons of an human nature a special synodal assembly with other formats. So you see, it's not just this synod that has a very strong ecumenical dimension, but the synod of bishops. And I want now to give you um, a little background what has happened before uh, this October assembly, because our idea of synod more and more, especially with Pope Francis, is that the synod is not just an assembly at a time, an event, but it is a process. And this process was launched by a preparatory document uh, that has launched the consultation in the local churches, as I have explained you. And we have highlighted that when we speak about synodality, that means turning together, um, it has to be understood from two different perspectives that are strongly interconnected. The first perspective looks at the internal life of the particular churches. So it's how we are church together as baptized, our relationships, especially relationships between pastors and faithful. But the second perspective that is fundamental considers how the people of God journeys together with the entire human family. So when we speak about synodality and when we speak about this synod, it's not just a synod focused on what is happening ad intra uh, inside the Catholic Church, but it goes hand in hand with the style of dialoguing and deepening our relationship, of course, with other Christians, but also uh, the dimension of interreligious dialogue, the dialogue with uh, the political uh, the world with the society, uh, 
synodality is completely articulated with a way to be church in the world with the style of dialogue. Our overarching question that is guiding the whole process, we can say the main question for our consultation is very simple. It's how does this churning together that we call synodality, which takes place today on different levels, from the local level to the universal one, allow the church to proclaim the gospel in accordance with her mission and strategy earth, and what steps does the Spirit invite us to take in order to grow as a synodal church? So all this process is to help us to become more and more synodal. That means to be a church that is a listening church, a church of dialogue, a church with a style of fraternity in which we are all together brothers and sisters in Christ. So in a way is to shift from an only uh, hierarchical way of looking at the church or to institutional way uh, to be church, to be a church, a relational church, a church of fraternity. And this process is to help us to be a, a church in a new style, this style of listening and discernment. Our way to understand synodality at this stage, at the end of this uh, October assembly uh, that we experienced uh, inside the Vatican, because we were in a big aula in the Vatican, you will see some photos after. We have been able to try to draft a kind of definition of uh, what it means to be a synodal church. Uh, and it's interesting because uh, we really highlight that when we listen to the people through all this consultation of the Batais, we can listen to their desire for the church to be as God's home and family, a church that is closer to the lives of our people, less bureaucratic and more relational. So it's really the call to become more and more and to be this church of closeness with this uh, putting at the center the relational, the relationships. And it's very interesting because the synod before, uh, the former synod we had before this synod was a synod on young people with also a process to listen to young people. And uh, we have understood from the new generation uh, that what they want and what they ask for the church is to be a synodal church. And we have understood that the only way to transmit the faith today is with the synodal style in which all are considered as protagonists, as subjects, and you don't have on one side those who teach or those who are the pastors, and on the other side, those who just learn and receive. But we are first of all, all together, we are first baptized, and then we have differences. So at this stage, the kind of definition we give for synodality, and it's uh, also a quote from our uh, synthesis report of this um, October assembly, Synodality can be understood as Christians walking in communion with Christ towards the kingdom along with the whole humanity. Its orientation is towards mission and its practice involves gathering in assembly at each level of ecclesial life. It involves reciprocal listening, dialogue, community discernment, and creation of consensus as an expression that renders Christ present in the Holy Spirit, each taking decisions in accordance with their responsibility. The richness and depth of the synodal process indicates the value of expanding participation and overcoming the obstacles to participation that have emerged so far. Maybe the most important thing that we have understood is that synodality is first of all a learning by doing. And the more we exercise this style of synodality that can be understood as a way 
to be church, a style of life, a style uh, to exercise the mission, but it's also a way to take decisions in which nobody takes decision alone, but uh, so it implies a way to exercise authority that is a servant leadership, a collaborative leadership, and a discerning leadership. And you can see that it's also uh, because in the Catholic Church we inherit during many centuries of a way uh, to exercise authority, sometimes that has been very, very personal and clerical. So now we retrieve that we have also um, to involve uh, all baptized in decision making processes. And the more we exercise this style of synodality, the more we understand what it is really uh, to be uh, synodal. And as we are uh, doing this path, that is a path of conversion, a path of transformation, we understand more and more that it is really uh, also a call to foster ecumenism. And I want to express, uh, to share with you what maybe for me has, has been the most um, uh, important uh, experience during our synod, because we had delegates, so 75% were bishops coming from really all over the world, because all bishops conference, they elect delegates, and then the Pope can also appoint other bishops. And for the first time in this synod, we had 25% of non-bishops who were also members of the synod and who for the first time had the right of vote. In former synod, we had also lay people, but they were just as observers, auditors, and they didn't have, uh, they didn't have the right of vote. And we have been leaving this synod in October. And as you know, among uh, almost half of the countries in our world uh, are living situation of violence, conflicts, wars. Uh, in October, um, the terrible situation in Holy Land uh, started on October 7. So we all this cry um, and all this uh, context of a world of crisis was really inside the Synod Hall. And at the same time, being together from many, many different countries, including countries that are uh, experiencing wars or conflicts, we have understood that we have really to continue to commit ourselves to uh, peace building, and uh, we have prayed a lot for peace during this synod. And I was really also touched that at a time in the small groups we organized during the synod, because a good part of the time was in small group with uh, a methodology I will explain after. On the same table, uh, round table, you had the Bishop of Moscow, from Russia and a bishop from um, Ukraine. And during the synod, they were uh, listening to each other and doing a common discernment together on the same table. And um, this really uh, give uh, our synodal methodology uh, in which we have experienced that it is possible uh, to give a voice to everybody, to listen to each other, to dialogue and to experience fraternal relationship is a kind of sign of hope in our uh, context. And when we speak uh, about also ecumenism, and it's also highlighted in our synthesis report, that's the situation we are experiencing together in so many uh, countries, uh, in not a few regions of the world, there is an ecumenism of blood stemming from Christians of different affiliation who give their lives for faith in Jesus Christ. The testimony of their martyrdom is more eloquent than any word. Unity comes from the cross of the Lord. And during the ecumenical prayer vigil, the fact that we were all together centered on the cross, the cross of San Damiano uh, from San Francis of Assisi, is, has really reminded us that 
our unity uh, comes from the cross of the Lord and the world in which we are living today with so uh, many violence and crises uh, is also building among us this call for unity uh, and this experience of ecumenism of uh, blood. And the second uh, aspect uh, really that we learn through this synodal process and trying to become more and more uh, a synodal church, we learn that the importance of what I can say uh, of the presence of the others. And in a way, the synodal process for us is a path of listening and to listen to those who are different. And uh, you have the photo here of our 12 uh, fraternal delegates at the Synod who really uh, took an active part in our process. They were uh, also uh, among the others uh, on the round table participating. They could also speak in the uh, big assembly uh, and really take an active part. And we realized that when we speak we can learn a lot from the experience of the other churches. So, of course, the Anglican Church, the Orthodox Church, and many others. And the synodality reminds us that we can't be church alone. We really need always to broaden our pers perspective. And now, in this uh, second part, uh, I would like to highlight how, in a very concrete way, this uh, call to foster ecumenism has arisen uh, through the process. So in the preparatory documents that, we, uh, that started the process in October 2021, we really uh, highlighted that this path includes the call to deepen relationships with other churches and Christian communities with which we are united by one baptism, and among the 10 topics uh, that were like 10 ways to look at the fundamental question, the overarching question I presented you at the beginning, there was a specific topic uh, about dialogue with the other, Christ the other Christian denominations, the dialogue between Christians of different confessions united by one baptism as a special place in a synodal journey. What relation do we have with the brothers and sisters of other Christian denomination? What areas do they concern? What fruits have we drawn from this journey together? What are the difficulties? So uh, it was very interesting because we had many feedback from all the local churches about how they experience uh, relationships and dialogue with other Christian denomination. And, uh, uh, looking at all uh, this uh, national synthesis and trying to draft uh, our synthesis, we have expressed from this listening, from this listening of the local churches and the people of God, that in this document that uh, was called uh, was titled "Document for the Continental Stage." Many reports, so those national synthesis, many reports emphasize that there is no complete synodality without unity among Christians. And uh, through different examples, uh, we have understood that many local churches are asking for uh, um, deepening uh, ecumenical dialogue. And uh, it was a kind of photography of where we are nowadays in ecumenical dialogue. And I quote again, since the Second Vatican Council, ecumenical dialogue has made progress. However, many ecumenical issues related to synodal structures and ministries in the church are still not well articulated. And uh, we know also that in some countries, sometimes it's not easy uh, to do this uh, ecumenical dialogue. So, in uh, coming from that, uh, in our document for uh, uh, that was uh, the working document for the October Assembly, there was a special chapter on uh, synodality and ecumenism, 
And uh, the question was, how can a synodal church fulfill its mission through a renewed ecumenical com commitment? The path of synodality, which the Catholic Church is on, is and must be ecumenical, just as the ecumenical path is synodal. Synodality is a common challenge that concerns all believers in Christ, just as ecumenism is first and foremost a common path traveled together with other Christians. Synodality and ecumenism are two paths to walk together with a common goal, a better Christian witness. This can take the form of coexistence in an ecumenism of life at different levels, including through interchurch marriages and also through the ultimate act of giving one's life as a witness to faith in Christ in the ecumenism of martyrdom. So what is interesting is that uh, this awareness is not just the awareness of some uh, maybe pastors or theologians who are really specialized in ecumenism, what is expressed here is coming from the listening, really, of the Christians at the grassroots. And so uh, ecumenism was one of uh, the topics we had to discern on during the October Assembly. Uh, and you can see here uh, some part of why we, um, of the document in which uh, the Instrumentum Laboris, that was the basis of our discussion about uh, ecumenism. And especially what we are experiencing as church with this uh, synodal uh, pass is to focus more on uh, first our common uh, vocation as baptized and our equal dignity as bataille. And because the Catholic Church is now more and more focusing on uh, baptism and the common experience of baptism, uh, it is a, an important basis because we share bat baptism in common with all Christians. And so uh, it also helps us to uh, deepen uh, this uh, path. And where we are now is also the fruit of all our ecumenical dialogue. Uh, I invite you, if you want to uh, see uh, in more details uh, how this call for uh, ecumenism came, to look at what uh, all continents have highlighted, but I will switch uh, this part to finish with um, some photo and some feedback. So you can see here uh, the, the setting of our synodal assembly. Before we had synods in a kind of amphitheater and it was organized with, uh, at the bottom of the amphitheater, we had the cardinals and the archbishops and the bishops and auxiliary bishops, priests, sisters, and le the lay people at the top. So it was in a very hierarchical way. And this time you can see everybody, whereas you are a cardinal or young uh, woman or young man, uh, we were all together uh, on this round table expressing in a very concrete way our equal dignity of baptize. And all the process was really organized as a spiritual process uh, to listen to the Holy Spirit. So uh, there was really a great part about prayer together, uh, celebrating Eucharist together. After the prayer vigil at the beginning, we had three days retreats before uh, beginning uh, our work in the Synod Hall. And we have also understood that uh, this is also the way to live ecumenism as a path of spiritual renewal. Ecumenism is first and foremost a matter of spiritual renewal that also requires processes for repentance and healing of memory. It is important that ecumenism is practiced first and foremost in daily life. So that's also what we express in our synthesis uh, report. 
And when we entered the Synod Hall, uh, the first thing just after the, the gate, we had this cross of uh, San Damiano, the cross of St. Francis of Assisi, that was at the center of the ecumenical prayer vigil, really to remind us that what we are doing in the Synod is ready for and with Christ. And uh, as I have said, we have experienced all this process, not as a kind of parliament or debate, but really as a spiritual experience. And the fact that we were able, before uh, initiating our works, to spend together three days um, of spiritual exercises, retreat to listen to the Holy Spirit, was uh, very helpful. And uh, we were blessed to have as preacher uh, brother Timothy Radcliffe from the UK, uh, as you know, a Dominican, and also a sister, a Benedictine uh, sister. And uh, what we have experienced in this uh, Synod Hall that you see with the uh, round table, that is the main fruit in a way of our Synod, is what we call the Synodal Methodology, is a methodology um, to really to listen to each other and to share on the different topic uh, we have to uh, reflect on, not first from um, just uh, an intellectual vision, but to share uh, from what we have prayed on. And this methodology called Conversation in the Spirit is really the best fruit of our synodal process. You can see here how we experience it. So there is a personal preparation in prayer and then a first round in which uh, each person has the same time uh, to express herself, three or four minutes. Then we take a time of silence and prayer. And the second round is uh, to share what we have listened to from the other, so to let uh, resonate in us what we have listened to. And then after a time of silence and prayer, the third step of this methodology is a way to build together and to see where we are, what are the convergences, what are the divergences or the question to deepen. And with this methodology, we have been able really to find a way to dialogue and to discern together where are our visions that can be very, very different on certain topics. And as the Synod is a process of conversion, as I have said, a process of change, it's a new way to be church. So it's not easy, as we know in all kinds of organizations, when you have a call for conversion or for change, you have resistance and fears. But with this methodology uh, and with all uh, the spiritual process, the prayer together, we can say, and I have uh, really, I can testimony that many, many participants who arrive at the Synod with some kind of fears then experience uh, really confidence. And when they experience this uh, Synodal pass with the Synodal methodology, they really see the fruits and how it is really a way to learn to work together and to live unity in diversity. Because what we see in the Catholic Church, and I think it's the same in all our uh, churches, is how in the world of today, it's not easy to live unity in diversity. We are in a world of polarization. We have more and more also cultural differences. But synodality, as we experience it, is really a way uh, to find a common path uh, and to build togetherness, a way to put it is also, uh, sometimes I say that synodality is to pass from the I to the we and to find practical and concrete paths uh, to build communion, but not a communion that is university, uh, that is a uniformity, but a communion with and through diversity. And that was really uh, our experience experience 
And that's how uh, we uh, have been experiencing this synod. And one of uh, the main takeaway is that when we look at all uh, the issues and challenging challenges we are facing, we can uh, we can really recognize that collaboration among all Christians is crucial in addressing the pastoral challenges of our time. In secularized societies, this enables the voice of the gospel to have greater force. In context of poverty, it impels people to join forces in the service of justice, peace, and the dignity of the last. In all instances, it is a resource for healing the culture of hatred, division, and war that pits groups, people, and nation against each other. So with this process, we uh, continue, as I say, to realize that we need to be together to face all those difficult challenges and that call uh, us to really uh, have this attitude of humility and to recognize our incompletedness and to continue to be a learning church and especially as a Catholic church, we are more and more aware that we also need to continue to learn from other churches and to experience what is at the core of ecumenism, uh, that is uh, the exchange of gifts. And really my last uh, conclusion, because I am already uh, late, uh, but I really want to invite you to read this uh, document, Synthesis Report of the First Session of this uh, assembly in which we highlight convergences, matters for consideration and proposals. Because in the first part, you have a part uh, dedicated uh, to uh, Christian unity on the road towards Christian unity. And what is very uh, interesting is that when we were uh, really discerning about the question of how to foster ecumenism and this call, there was a very, very strong consensus. So uh, we can see that where we are now, this question of ecumenism and deepening ecumenism is not a matter of debate. It's like uh, a fruit uh, of all the paths we have already accomplished since the beginning of the ecumenism movement and after the Second Vatican Council. And so there is a very strong consensus that we need to go forward. And there are very concrete proposals also to express how we could move forward in our uh, document. So I stop now. I would have liked to share more with you, but uh, I'm sorry for the technical problems. And I really hope that it will invite us to continue the journey together and you can do it so in a very concrete way, uh, just taking this document, reflecting on it, on it and continuing to share also with us um, so that we continue the journey together. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share with you. Thank you, Sister Natalie, so much. It's such a, a privilege to hear you and the way in which you've woven so many strands together, not least this relationship between synodality and justice and peace, synodality and ecumenism, uh, the sense that actually synodality is a way of life for the whole church rather than, as it were, a project. Um, I was particularly struck by what you said about your methodology, this sense of a way forward conversation in the spirit. So many churches, including my own, uh, could learn from that. We've got a couple of, um, of questions coming in. And friends, we have a few minutes. So if you have any questions for Sis and Anthony, please do type them in the chat box. But the first one is from Aaron Sonderson Cross. He asks Sister Natalie, what practical steps can Catholics take to deepen our faith and ecumenism with our fellow Anglicans? with whom we share so much culture and history? Well, there are different uh, possible steps. I, I would highlight uh, that, uh, as you know, what is still also at stake and in discussion um, is uh, also the way uh, we exercise and the way we look uh, at the primacy of the Pope uh, in, the, in the Catholic Church. 
And with the synod, we understand more and more that there is no synodality without primacy and no primacy without synodality. But what is at stake, not only for the primacy, but also for the collegiality of the bishop, is really the way we exercise leadership. And one of the topics that you can see in, uh, in the document, because you see when you look at synodality and you reflect on how uh, you can become a more synodal church, it will touch at all aspects of the, of the church. So in our document, you have, of course, a chapter on women, because that's uh, also how we are all together, men and women in the church, how you foster women's participation. You have a chapter on priests and deacons, another one on bishops, and there is also another one on uh, the Pope uh, as a bishop of Rome. And what we see, and I have also here from our fraternal delegates during the synod, is the way Pope Francis attended and was uh, among us at the Ecumenical Vigil of Prayer, but also during the Synod. He was also in his round table, just a little bit over the other. You know, gives also some images, expression of another way to exercise the primacy. And as you know, um, it was John Paul II who has opened this question. And I think uh, it will that we, it will continue to have uh, a reflection on that. And we see that at this stage, there is also uh, the other churches recognize a kind of primacy. Uh, and I think that's really hopeful for the way forward. Another very concrete topic in which we could also uh, continue is about uh, intercommunion. Uh, and there is a proposal that you, I can uh, read uh, about uh, about that. Uh, so it's it's uh, well, it's a matter to to consider and to to, to deepen. Um, and and I think uh, it's something also we can do together and see uh, how. Uh, Yes, because uh, that's what, it came as an important topic among uh, ecumenical relationship, especially also because all over the world we have more and more mixed family uh, with uh, one Catholic, one from another. Uh, so it's also the world of today, as I say, it's not only because we have big challenges to face together, but the reality that is a more uh, diverse, uh, pluralistic world, it's also in our family. And uh, so that's, those are possible steps that we can uh, try to explore. Those particularly interested in the primacy question, um, do have a look at the 1998 document of ARCIC II, the gift yes. of authority, which is still, I think, remarkably fresh in its insight. Time, I think, uh, Natalie, just for one more very quick question, if we may. Somebody asks, what do you expect will happen now in local churches before the second session of the assembly? So there are two levels. Uh, we are, uh, the first thing is really to uh, share uh, in the local churches uh, what has happened in the October assembly. So the members who were at the assembly continue to share their experience, to present the fruit of the synod, to invite all the people to read uh, this document. Then uh, with our Council of the Synod, and we have a meeting uh, to tomorrow, we are finishing uh, to discern more concretely the guidelines uh, and what we will ask to bishops' conferences and local churches, how they will contribute uh, before the next assembly. So we have to wait a little bit. But then the most important is, uh, you know, one thing is to what can be decided and experienced at the universal level in Rome. But what is very important is how we continue to implement synodality at the grassroots, uh, in the parishes, in the dioceses. And in this document, you have already many proposals that can be put into practice. For instance, one, and I think that's really something we can we could do together as Catholic and Anglican is uh, formation. 
and how uh, to do that, we need, that was one of the main topics, we need a formation for synodality, we need to also develop a kind of synodal formation, other pedagogies, and I am dreaming, I think we could do a lot together, uh, especially on this new style of leadership, uh, that is the synodal leadership, with this collaborative uh, style of leadership, servant leadership. This, I think there are many things we, we could imagine together. Uh, the fact also that it's also how we really organize our councils uh, and our uh, participative structures. It's not enough to have the structure if you don't have the mindset and the people and the process to really have a discerning process in a council. So on many things, we can help each other or do things uh, together. And we hope uh, that, uh, as I said, during this intercession, there will be creative initiatives in the grassroots, especially in the field of ecumenism and uh, uh, relationships between our churches. Friends, I'm very, very sad to say we're out of time. Uh, this conversation could go on and on. And on behalf of everybody who's uh, participated today, I want to thank Sister Natalie so much uh, for, for, for not only fitting this into her schedule, but for giving us so much this afternoon. Uh, Natalie, the way in which you've woven together so many themes and spoken from your own experience of this extraordinary event which continues, not just in the Catholic Church, but as it were, for the life of the whole church, for the life of the world as well. We're deeply grateful to you and we promise our prayers. Friends, you will be able to enjoy this uh, video again uh, very soon once it is edited and up on Westminster Abbey's YouTube site. So please feel free to go back there uh, and to share it with those who are interested. And I'm sorry we haven't been able to pose other questions that have been asked this afternoon. The Koinonia seminars for next term will be advertised in the next couple of weeks. So please keep an eye on the Abbey's website and social media. And if you're not on the email list, please uh, just make sure you email the RSVP address uh, and you will, you will be added to it. Once again, huge thanks to Sister Natalie. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Do read the Synod documents. And if you get a chance also, Father Timothy Radcliffe's um, remarkable retreat addresses to the Synod, which have insights, surely, which pertain to all Christians interested in this topic. God bless you, and on behalf of all of us here at Westminster Abbey, have a holy and happy celebration of Advent.